Well, thank you very much, uh, Olaf, uh, for those two kind uh, remarks. I will say that that's a heck of a family, that Halverson family and Thor. Uh, we thank you uh, eternally for all of the good work that you have done here to pull this, uh, this, this group together. It's been absolutely extraordinary, and I'm quite frankly quite humbled to, uh, to be here in front of all of these great fighters uh, on behalf of freedom. I would say that mine is the most depressing of jobs. On the other hand, mine is also the most rewarding and the most fulfilling. If you look at the vocabulary of my job, it is slaughter, starvation, mutilation, malnutrition, rape, brutality, persecution. This defines the group of people that end up being my charges or the charges of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Now, I don't want you to mix up the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees with the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner. The, the, the initials are almost exactly the same, but we have a world of difference in terms of what we do, and I think a world of difference in how we go about doing it. We are in charge of being the people who actually receive refugees, who work with refugees, with internally displaced people, and who take care of them and who protect them around the world. And as uh, Olaf Halverson said, there are 32 million of them. This is really dealing with the consequences of humanity's darkest underside. Victims may not measured in tens or hundreds, but in millions. We are exposed daily to the depravity that mankind can work on its fellow man. If we rank the people that we take care of on the index of freedom globally, they would rank at the absolute bottom. These are people who have been deprived of their livelihoods, deprived of all of their earthly possessions, have been deprived of their country, and in many cases, people whose families have depri been deprived of their very lives. They are at the bottom of the heap of humanity in terms of the difficulties that they have faced and that they continue to face, living outside of their countries, in foreign lands, struggling simply to survive. I must say, when one looks at their lot in life, one cannot help but be overwhelmed by their suffering and really discouraged by their lack of opportunity and their prospects because their prospects are very, very thin indeed. Yet in the midst of this horror, one cannot help but be struck by the fact that even among the world's great, most downtrodden people, hope and the flame of liberty and the flame of freedom continue to burn. Sometimes it's just a flicker. But you still will go into camps, as I have been into camps in Iraq or in Syria or Jordan or Darfur or Pakistan, or Colombia, places where people have really been oppressed or have been the cause or have been forced to flee their homes because of conflict. When you go and visit those people, you'll always hear a child laughing, you'll always have an adult smiling, and you'll always find a community hoping that someday their lives will improve. You cannot extinguish the flame of freedom. My job, the responsibility, vocation, and I would say even avocation of UNHCR is to, is to nurture this flame, to help it keep burning until the dream that it symbolizes is realized. There can be no greater calling, no more rewarding vocation. I could bore you with how we go about doing this. Suffice it to say that we are the antithesis of the very stereotype that many try and pin on the United Nations, sometimes with good justification. We are quick, we're responsive, we are caring. We can take care of 500,000 people on 72 hours notice anywhere in the world. We are a highly responsive organization. When disaster strikes, as it does everywhere in all parts of the world at one time or another, we are on the scene. We are lean, and we are deployed in the most difficult and dangerous environments around the world. Our daily fare is the daily fare of having people being killed in the line of work, or of being taken hostage, or of being maimed, or of getting diseases of a type you would hardly believe. 
No organization on the planet has a more dedicated staff living under more impossible conditions. We care for victims on the borders of Somalia, the jungles of Colombia, in Darfur, in the camps of Myanmar. We help the millions of displaced in and around Iraq. We work in the Congo, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kosovo, Chechnya, and Sri Lanka. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. The number of catastrophes that we have to deal with around the world on a regular basis is absolutely extraordinary and appalling, I must say. At the beginning of last week, I could have counted something like 600,000 internally displaced people in Pakistan. Today, it's a million 600,000. One week. One week. And who's on the ground helping those people? It's the good people who work for me in UNHCR. Where there are people who have been forced to flee to protect their lives and their freedom, you will find always that there's a dedicated staff of UNHCR there helping out. We do what we can, but the task is not an easy task. It is an extraordinarily difficult task. When our funding is only half of what needs to be in order to take care of the, of the many refugees in the world, how do you decide who to serve? And how do you decide what to serve? Does one focus only on the short-term needs and abandon durable solutions? Maybe. Do you insist that every refugee child have a primary school education before the first refugee child goes to secondary school when you don't have enough money to fund everybody? And where there are bright students who graduated from school and who can make a contribution to their community, to their community if they went to secondary school or even university? These are the difficult decisions that we have to make, and we make those on a regular basis. It is an extraordinarily difficult job. How do you handle your prioritization when you have issues of childhood anemia, which is endemic in refugee camps, which is debilitating to not only the children, but that damages them for their entire lives, and you don't have enough funds to handle both that need fully and to also handle the pervasive phenomenon of rape of, of refugee women? Which one of those is the important thing to do? Impossible. It is impossible to reach judgments on many of these issues, and yet judgments have to be reached. So they are reached at the end of the day. We have other problems too. We deal in totalitarian governments because totalitarian governments have more than their share of internally displaced people. So around the world where you find freedom has been almost extinguished, and remains only a hope in the minds of people, you will find UNHCR taking care of people and protecting people in those environments. And it is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It's difficult because if you do not become an advocate with the governments on behalf of the people, then you're a party to the human rights violation yourself. On the other hand, if you become too strong an advocate, if you push so hard that you are kicked out of the country, as happens to us from time to time for some of the countries that we've talked about in the course of the last two days, if you push too hard, then you are forced to abandon the very people whose hope you are charged with maintaining. Very, very difficult things to do. Obviously, we have to find a balance, and a balance is in everything that we do. It's in trying to find the right balance, to pursue the right objectives in the most prudent and practical and pragmatic way. So I have thought long and hard about what it is that we should be, I should be talking about here today with this distinguished group. I can't match you in terms of the suffering that many, many of you have had. Uh, in their pursuit of freedom. I have spent a good deal of my life working on the issue, but not in the same way that you have worked on the issue. And I'm humbled by the fact that, that, that you are gathered here together and giving testimony to everything that you have lived in. But there was one area that I thought would be worth talking to you about. And I speak of the relationship between principle and pragmatism. And in speaking of pragmatism, let me make it absolutely clear, I'm not talking about appeasement. I'm not talking about the abandonment of principles. I'm talking about finding the most effective way to achieve the principles. The word pragmatism, I think, got a dirty name in the course of many, many years because it was misused as being a way of explaining inaction. But in fact, pragmatism, if properly used, is the enabling tool that allows principles to be achieved. 
So in that context, I would leave you with a couple of maxims. First, in the pursuit of freedom, pragmatism, unguided by principle, destroys the freedom it is designed to foster. Principles are not just an end in themselves. They must guide the very actions undertaken to achieve those very ends. This group knows that. But not everybody that I have worked with over my career understands that. In fact, as I go through this, this particular set of lessons, if you will, um, I have found that I have had to address this issue far more frequently than you would imagine. People who abandon their principles in the pursuit of a principle. And it doesn't work. It is doomed to failure. But similarly, in the pursuit of freedom, principle unguided by pragmatism will not succeed it will usually destroy order, create anarchy, and anarchy is as great an enemy of freedom as is totalitarianism. So in the pursuit of what it is that you're trying to get done, you must pursue pragmatic mechanisms uh, in order to try and achieve those objectives, or you risk, uh, you risk ending up in the, in the final analysis uh, opposing the very freedoms that you're trying to promote. Over 40 years of my career, I've had the opportunity to work more than on any other subject on the global quest for freedom in Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, the Middle East, sometimes on policy, strategy, tactics, and sometimes on the front lines of implementation. My core competency, if to use the jargon of human resources, uh, is not public advocacy on behalf of freedom. My core competency is on getting it done that is to say, on the practical steps that are necessary to go at achieving the objective. That is what I have excelled at in terms of my career. That is what has caused Republican administrations and Democratic administrations, both within the US system, to call upon my services to deal with the various situations I've had to deal with around the world. Now, I've had a lot of successes, but not nearly the kinds of successes that you have had in this audience. In fact, some of them are the same successes, and I will take my share of the credit, be it very, very small, and the largest amount of the credit is obviously yours for having been on the front lines of fighting these battles. Uh, and I'm pleased and I'm proud of the, of the successes we've had, but I've had just as many failures. And we, and here I'm speaking as an American in the US government, have probably had more failures then we have had successes as we've tried to promote freedom around the world. So I think it's necessary for us to take a look and see what is it that has caused the failures as we have set about trying to achieve the objectives. And I go back to this issue of the balance between pragmatism and principle. It is there that I think that we find most of the failures is when we have failed to get that right. The history of freedom's failures is a history of those who lost sight of their principles in the pursuit of freedom, as well as the failures of those who allowed their zeal uh, to overcome their pragmatic common sense on how to get the job done. And both of those will lead you to failure. As American, I will tell you quite frankly that in recent times I have seen those failures on both sides. That is to say, I have seen us fail because of pragmatic search for information in the area of, uh, in the fight against terrorism, led us into the violation of our principles. And I've also seen how a, an unstructured and unthought through effort to try and bring democracy to the world uh, has led to catastrophe. And sometimes, and probably, results that were the opposite of what we tried to achieve. What is great about our country is, is that we recognize our failures and we recover from them uh, and we internalize the lessons and move on and have learned from our experiences. Too many countries do not do that. So, I think the lesson for us all now is to study these issues, to go back, to really understand where it is we've succeeded, where it is we've failed, what are the tactics that have worked, what are the tactics that have not worked, and not allow ourselves to be consumed by the failures of the past, to not disengage from the world, but rather to re-engage in the world, but this time more intelligently and more effectively. I think if we do it right, if we're clever about how we go about doing it, if we work together and we end up with common strategies and tactics and we work out the mechanisms necessary to achieve freedom, then we can work together to make freedom's flame 
burn even brighter yet. Thank you very much, and God bless you for what you do.